George Hubert Wilkins spent his early years on his parents' farm at Mount Bryant, South Australia. Severe drought killed off their stock and ruined the family prospects in the area. They moved to Adelaide, where young George took an interest in engineering and cinematography. He worked in the Australian hinterland for several years in harsh and exciting circumstances, filming wildlife and lifestyles with the emerging cinematic technology, though the experience of the ruined farm of his childhood stayed with him and saw him wondering if Australian farmers might benefit from a greater understanding of the role of Antarctica on the nation's climate. He spent several years in the Arctic, learning to survive at high latitudes under the guidance of Wilhelmia Stephenson, a big advocate of adapting to the local environment by adopting local practices, a stark contrast to the European mode of taking temperate latitude habits north and dying horribly of starvation or scurvy. During the First World War, Wilkins served as photographer, documenting Australian soldiers' experiences in Europe and earning the accolade, The Bravest Man I Have Ever Seen, from General Sir John Monash. He first travelled to Antarctica as part of the grandly named British Imperial Antarctic Expedition, which eventually comprised just two men living in an old boat on a tiny island with seven dogs for the 1921 Austral winter. A disappointing result when the expedition leader, Dr John Cope, led Wilkins to believe this constituted the first step toward establishing his long-dreamt-of Antarctic meteorological stations. The following year, Wilkins joined the Shackleton Rowett Expedition, Further disappointment followed, as the airframe Sir Ernest Shackleton promised him use of over Antarctic shores was left behind in South Africa, and then Shackleton died while at South Georgia. The expedition faffed about for a few months before heading north with very little achieved. Wilkins' growing notoriety as a competent high-latitudes operator saw him receive backing from Detroit-based industrialists in an attempt to fly across the Arctic. He engaged a bush pilot from the USA, Ben Eilson, and together they embarked on a flight from Barrow to Spitsbergen. Roald Amundsen, engaged in his own flight to the North Pole by airship with mining fortune air Lincoln Ellsworth, deemed Wilkins' flight impossible, which is a big deal considering how many things other people deemed impossible Roald Amundsen already did. Eilson flew the Lockheed Vega while Wilkins navigated. They landed on the ice in a previously unexplored region of the Arctic and used rudimentary sonar to determine that the Arctic lies over an ocean and not a landmass. They flew on to Spitsbergen, arriving in a storm but on target because of Wilkins' excellent navigation, which took into account the huge magnetic variation their path took them through and the effect of highly variable winds on their course over ground. Wilkins received a knighthood for this effort, becoming Sir Hubert. Wilkins drew attention from William Randolph Hearst, who loved attention-grabbing headlines. Hearst funded an attempt to sail under the North Pole by submarine. The Nautilus, a second-hand US Navy boat, adapted, badly, to under-ice work by a mad, or at least bad, submarine engineer did sail under the sea ice at the Arctic margin, but never stood much chance of sailing to the North Pole. Sir Hubert pulled the pin before anyone got hurt, but headed south with substantial debts to his backers, Lincoln Ellsworth in particular. Wilkins turned his attention south, intending flying across the Antarctic continent. Richard Byrd was heading south at the same time with some government backing and a very good pilot he poached from Amundsen's Arctic team, Bernd Balkan. After several false starts, Eilson and Sir Hubert took off from the volcanic caldera of Deception Island near the Antarctic Peninsula. The shoddy runway the conditions at Deception Island forced them to use restricted how much fuel the aircraft could carry. The transcontinental flight was off the cards, but they flew their Vega down the eastern side of the Antarctic Peninsula, the first time anyone charted a previously unseen coast from the air. Sir Hubert named the geographic features after friends, sponsors and colleagues, turning the flight around at Hurstland, later revealed to be an island. Heavy cloud covered Deception Island on their return, but again, Sir Hubert's navigation was right on the money, and Arson descended through the murk 
to find the Vega directly over the runway. They'd completed the first flight over Antarctica. Richard Bird made the first flight to the South Pole with Burnt Balkan at the controls of his Ford Trimotor, but he never liked anyone else getting accolades he figured should belong to him, and the Wilkins and Eilson flight got on his nerves. Unfortunately for Bird, Bird got on Balkan's nerves, and the talented pilot, engineer and mechanic joined Sir Hubert's team, replacing Ben Eilson, who died flying to the aid of a stranded crew of furriers in the Arctic. Lincoln Ellsworth employed Sir Hubert and Bernd Balkan to help him fly across Antarctica in a Northrop Gamma. Sir Hubert arranged all the logistics, and Balkan got the Gamma airborne, again after a series of false starts, but poor weather forced the flight back to its starting point at Snow Hill Island. Ellsworth was furious that Balkan turned back and scolded the pilot in the manner of a spoilt, rich prig. Balkan justifiably spat the dummy, so when the party returned the following Austral summer, Wilkins employed Canadian bush pilot Herbert Hollick Kenyon as Balkan's replacement. The Gamma took off from Dundee Island and flew toward the South Pole, using a set of navigational notes Sir Hubert prepared for them, on account of Lincoln Ellsworth being a chump when it came to using compass and sextant. Ellsworth got them lost in the Antarctic interior, and they were unable to make contact with their support team using the portable radio. Examining Ellsworth's sextant, Hollick Kenyon realised it wasn't calibrated, bordering on useless. He bodged a fix that worked well enough that they got to within walking distance of their goal, but it was a near-run thing, and they still had to wait for two weeks at Bird's old coastal base for Sir Hubert and his team to sail around the continent to collect them. Sir Hubert Wilkins continued to push for meteorological stations at high latitudes, but the Australian government didn't heed him. With Sir Douglas Mawson already fulfilling Australia's requirements for an Antarctic hero, Sir Hubert fell out of the popular consciousness after his death, but those people who do know his story find a lot to admire in his mode and his achievements. The farm he grew up on now lies outside the land considered arable in South Australia, but people who care about Sir Hubert's legacy brought the farmhouse back from the disrepair it fell into after the Wilkins family left it. George C. Hubert Wilkins, Australian Antarctic Pioneer. For more oral Antarctic history, you can find over a million words on the topic spoken into the digital ether at the Ice Coffee Podcast.